So the cool thing about this weekend is I'm not doing all the speaking. So um, just to share a little bit um, about Heather, I've known Heather. Actually, Heather and I went to high school together in the 80s. And... <laughs> we we weren't actually we were we were in choir together in high school. We weren't actually like friends, probably like we were friends, but we didn't hang out. Um and then God brought us to the same church years ago and um thirty years later, here we still are. She still loves me. And so um the cool thing about the last year is um we had this planned last year in March. And then COVID happened, and the world shut down. The conference was canceled. At that point, the Carters were still in the States, um, and it was just kind of weird. Like, it was a heavy year. Those weeks, like, I worked in the, during the time because it was essential. I worked during that time, and the world was quiet, and there was no traffic anywhere, and I felt inappropriate being at the grocery store, and everyone was full of fear, and... and um, so it was just, it was also disheartening. But God had a plan, but God, but God. God had a plan in it all. Um, none of this is any surprise to him. None of it is a shocker. Or God's not shaken by anything that's happened over the last year. Even politics. He wasn't surprised by who the president is. Go figure. Um, but in the last year, God took them to the Dominican Republic, um, and the lessons that Heather has brought um, from there are even deeper than what, what God would have taught her last year. And this is the same exact subject matter as we had planned last year. And so Heather had told me a while back that they were going to be able to be here what, into April because they'd been invited by a local church to teach at a, Lee was teaching at a conference and so I talked to Dwayne. I was like, can we plan on them coming sooner um, for the conference? And so we chatted through everything, and they were able to come earlier, and now they get more time here with friends and family. And um, I just can't tell you how, how precious it is to have, have my friend here um, to be able to share what God's taught her um, the life of ministry is not an easy life, and certainly under different government and different culture and so many, so many different things that they have to deal with. They have different battles than we have here, whether ministry or not. I'm not saying that ministry is any more so difficult. It just presents different challenges. Um, so this is Heather Carter, and if you will give her a round of applause to welcome her to speak before us tonight. Okay, this is weird. I'm kind of having a little out-of-body experience because I'm always, like, looking forward to who's teaching. <laughs> what are they going to say? <laughs> Wait, I am crud. Okay. So, like Teresa said, when, when all this craziness started last year, um, just to give you a little bit of story as to where I was at when Teresa had asked last year if I could teach the women's conference. Um, we had been on deputation for about a year, planning to go to the Dominican Republic um, on the mission field and to do full-time missions there. We'd been doing short-term missions back and forth for about five years, but it was obvious that it needed full-time attention. And so um, God just kind of directed that and we said yes. So we'd been doing Deputation, that's like a fancy word for visiting lots of churches and partnering up with people so that you can leave. And um, we were in, we had sold everything and left our home in Decatur, Alabama um, and moved into a little like two room house, two bedroom house in Decatur that was, belonged to a church family. And it was furnished. We sold everything, but we each took like three suitcases to the new house. Um, that way, when God provided, we could get out. And so we were continuing to do deputation. And then 
We were in California, like in, excuse me, I'm going to grab this. <laughs> Thank you. So we were in um, California in like, it was February. It was January. Um, my husband was in Seattle, Washington, the day that they announced there was such a thing as COVID and it started in Seattle. I was like, oh. But that, that's just interesting. Um, so I had gone out to the West Coast to be with him, to visit some churches. While we were in the West Coast, um, the lady from church called and she's like, I have some news. <laughs> okay. I sold the house. Which, I mean, great for her. You know, that was really good for her. And we were just borrowing it, so I couldn't say, I mean, you know. Okay, well, I'm not home right now. <laughs> I'm in California. I can get back to you about this. And so, of course, you know, she was very gracious, and we got home and needed to figure out where to live again. And there was uh, another lady, indicator, who oftentimes would host missionaries when they would come in town. And we thought, well, I mean, we're going to be leaving anytime soon. I mean, probably in just a month or two. <laughs> probably in just a month or two. So we asked Martha, and I love to say who these people are because praise God for them being used to house us for months um, when they were just willing to be used by God, even in something that maybe you don't think is a very big deal. But when you open your home to someone like that and you make them feel welcome, um, that is a big deal. Um, so Martha let us move in with like two weeks' notice, and we thought, we'll be out by April. And then the world shut down. <laughs> and Delta canceled our plane tickets two or three times. <laughs> and uh, so we waited, and we waited, and we're still living with Martha, bless her heart. She just was stuck with us. And it, but it was a blessing for both, I mean, she didn't have to be alone. Okay, there are a lot of older adults who have been alone for way too long. And she will just tell you, I praise God that you were stuck here because I wasn't alone. So uh, we got to live with Martha until July. And then in July, we had literally a one-week window of being able to... Um, get into the country. So we bought plane tickets and they did not get canceled. That was our first good sign. We got into the country. We had nine suitcases and us three. And um, anyway, so, and then the curfew, they closed the country back down. Like they let it open for a week. There was a new president and I think he just kind of wanted to look like, look, I'm doing something good for the country. And we were very thankful that God opened that window. And we bolted in, and then they shut it down with curfews and stuff like that. So we've been there since July. Um, and it's just crazy how in the last 10 months, it feels like it's been so much longer than 10 months. And yet, I'm like, it's only been 10 months. not that big a deal. But the amount of just change and learning and growth and, that goes on in that first little bit is nuts. So anyway, I feel like this is the same material from back then, but maybe not for y'all, because you don't know what I thought the first time I put it on paper, but I do, and now I see it a second time, and I'm like, oh, that's what that was about. So, and it's really cool, because even this week in reviewing my notes, I had some things in my heart that I was really trying to work through, and I was trying really hard to just work through them between me and God. You know, just one of those situations like, if I can just work this out with him, other things will take care of themselves, it'll be fine. And I'm waiting and waiting and it's not happening. And I was like, okay, I'll just work on it after the women's conference. You know, let me get past this and teach this and I'll just work on it after that. And then today, Lee's sitting at me with, at lunch and he's like, so do you go through your stuff? Yeah, and we're just having small talk. And he's like, so, so tell me about what you're teaching, and we're talking about it, and I'm talking through, and my issue with God is just staring me in the face. 
okay? Just know you're not going to deal with this after. You're going to deal with it now so that you can just share with the ladies my word. So here goes. Um, We're going to be talking this weekend through Ruth, um, but funny enough, the scripture isn't from Ruth. That's just how God works. He's funny like that. He has a great sense of humor. I'm sure of it. Uh, So our kind of key verse um, is Lamentations 358. O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. And um, I just love that because I feel needy sometimes. Like, I need pleaded for. Plus, that's very affectionate. For someone to plead for you, you know, it's just uh, very endearing. So anyway, that's the scripture he gave me that kind of ties all of this together. You'll see it a few times. And, and it's not super long, so you could maybe even memorize it, but whatever. Um, but we're going to look at the book of Ruth. And when I knew that we were going to look at the book of Ruth, I was like, that's kind of boring. Every women's conference looks at the book of Ruth. And it was a little predictable, it felt like, but it doesn't matter, because if that's what God wanted taught, then that's what we're going to teach, and there's definitely some good stuff in there that I could not have come up with, so we know it was from him. Um, But we're going to start with Naomi, because without Naomi, there's really no Ruth. Um, And this is lead, follow, and get out of the way, because we hear that lead, follow, or get out of the way all the time. But in our Christian life, it takes all three. Sometimes you're leading. You should always be following. And we always have to get out of the way. And it's just kind of this melding of those things together that helps us walk with the Lord the way that he wants us to. Um, We're going to talk about God's sovereignty. We're redeemed for a purpose. Sovereignty is a fancy word, but it just means... I can't see that. Wait. Having all authority. Having all authority. Um, So it's the idea that God will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. The cool thing is we get to be a part of it. We have the option to be a part of it. And um, through a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can walk with him and have a part of that plan that he has. Um, and function in it. So the book of Ruth shows us really great pictures about how to do that, how to walk with him, um, and how he has that kind of relationship with us. Um, Let's start, and I'm going to read Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. We'll start there. Uh, We're going to have lots of scripture, so like have your phone ready to flip, have your Bible ready to flip, or pencil to write them down, (laughs) because... I like scripture. Amen. Okay. Ruth chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion. Uh, Ephrathites? Ephrathites? Yeah. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. And the name of one was Orpah, and the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me." The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. 
And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that, ye, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much more for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So here's some history about Moab. We're going to turn to Genesis 19, 37. So Moab was a bad start, okay? Um... Genesis 19, actually we're going to start in verse 36. It says, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. So, you know, when you're studying the Bible, a lot of times they'll teach you go to the law of first mention. Okay, that's like the first time something is spoken about in the Bible. This is Moab. That's a bad start. Um, and so, kind of in, in history, Moab did not have a good reputation. The person didn't have a good start, and the city itself was um, not good. So in Numbers 22, and we're going to start in verse 12. It says, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. So Moab and Israel were against each other, okay? Um, it was bad enough to move there. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, he, he moved them there. But then their sons took wives from there. So they bought in, right? You'll hear people talk about buying into coaching or whatever. They bought in. They took wives from Moab. Um, and so, it was frustrating because Naomi had bad leadership. Um, and she was married to this man. She was submitted to him, but he led her to a city that was forsaken. And her sons took wives where they shouldn't have. And um, just because there was bad leadership didn't excuse her from following Jesus. He is sovereign. And recently in a message on submission from our family pastor in Decatur, Danny Holmes stated, any issue we have with authority is ultimately a problem trusting God's sovereignty. And I was like, ooh, I had to write it down because I didn't like it. <laughs> That truth stings, but anytime I have trouble with authority, then I go, mm, God, are you really able? Do you really have authority to do what you, can, what you say you can do, what you're going to do, what you promise to do? So any issue we have with authority is ultimately a problem, trusting God's sovereignty. Um, so many examples. Joshua, you know, he had horrible circumstances, and yet, he trusted God's sovereignty that he would be cared for. Daniel, he had horrible circumstances. Um, ultimately, Jesus, right, had horrible circumstances, and yet he had to say, Father, forgive them, for they, don't, they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. Um, so, verse 7, back in Ruth, chapter 1.
We're going to read 7 through 9 again. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Um, And I just felt like Naomi lost sight for the loss because of her circumstances. The fact that Orpah and Ruth didn't follow her God escaped her. And I may have do the exact same thing in those circumstances. But it's just easy sometimes when things are difficult around us or if there's uh, lack of leadership, or are you feeling alone, and there, there, or there's, yeah, no leadership at all, or whatever the case may be that's brought you to that place where you just lose sight of the real issue. And it's, I mean, it's easy to do, right? We have to die daily. We have to regain that focus over and over again. Um, but this is just kind of an example um, of Naomi. So, Again, even though she was disobedient and losing vision for these two lost ladies, God's sovereignty um, was even bigger and always is than our disobedience. So verse 16, God used Ruth's love for Naomi to draw Ruth to him. So verse 16 says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And Ruth just loved Naomi. God was using this relationship to draw Ruth to him. And we are surrounded by that every day, every day. Maybe it's not a daughter-in-law. Okay, maybe it's not somebody that wants to move to another country with you. <laughs> but maybe they wanted to go to lunch with you at work, you know, or um, go have coffee, or <laughs> spill their guts about their weekend to you, which can be uncomfortable sometimes, but it's that draw that they have to Jesus in you, that he is using to draw them to him. And that's what was happening with Naomi and Ruth. So Naomi returns to Judah. Um, Oh, I'm going to back up real quick. Uh, Bad circumstances. They can still be used of God. Um, I just want to give a little example, a little testimony. Um, So Lee and I got married in 1993. And my husband got saved in 1994. And that was a surprise to me because I thought he was saved. But um, God is sovereign, and he just kept pursuing him and pursuing him and pursuing him. But let me tell you about how I reacted the day my husband got saved. This will make you feel great about yourself. (laughs) So... um, it's after church, and Lee didn't come in and sit with me in church, and I thought, that's weird. And then after church, he walked up to me, and I was like, where have you been? And he's like, well, I was over talking to Dwayne and Kevin, and I'm like, why? He goes, I got saved. And I was like, what? <laughs> Just silent, straight face, no words, walk to the car, shut the car, go home, still no words get home, out of the car, back in the house, still no words. (laughs) Probably the longest I've kept my mouth closed in a long time. (laughs) So anyway, I was not a happy camper. And I couldn't figure out why I was so mad. Um, I'm still not sure why I was so mad. It just was shocking to me because he was like in the choir and doing a lot of church Things and I thought, well, this is this is shocking. And so uh, he 
took an afternoon nap, and I sat down at the table, and I was like, I'm not getting in the bed with that guy. I'll just sit here at this table and be your redhead. And so, if you know, you know. <laughs> and so, um, I was just talking to God, and I'm like, why? Why? What, what is this about? Why, why did I marry a lie? You know, it was all about me. I was very young and self-centered. And, um, but this is the scripture that God gave me that day. And even when we're young and self-centered and childish, um, he is so faithful and his word is perfect. And it will not return void. And he just has these moments where he's like, ah, I got your attention, now you'll listen right? And that's what that was. Lee's salvation was kind of my, oh, let me listen to God for a minute. And this is what 1 Corinthians said. This is what God was like, here was your role, lady. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him Let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And I was like, oh. And that was my role, was just to keep him separated from the world long enough for God to get a hold of his heart. Um, So bad circumstances, difficult circumstances, Um, that doesn't change God's sovereignty or how he can work in a situation. And so I just want to encourage you with that testimony, like um, most people, (laughs) this will come out funny, but most people wouldn't believe like that I was the more spiritually mature one at one time, okay? Like Lee was a baby Christian when we got married or after we got married and I had been in church for a little while and had learned some things. And so um, it's just kind of funny because people go, really? Um, but it's true. Okay, so um, Naomi returns to Judah. Um, verses 19 through 22. So she's had this difficult circumstances. She's kind of lost sight for Ruth and Orpah. Um, but Ruth is like, nope, I'm staying. I, I, I'm going with you. Uh, my love for you is, is more than my own country. And so Naomi returns to Judah. We're going to look at Ruth chapter 1. Go back there. I told you we're going to be flipping a lot. Um, verse 19 through 22. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? Quite a homecoming, huh? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Guys, this was her thought process, okay? She legit thought, God has testified against me. This is personal. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Um, So one thing that struck me when I read this um, is how transparent Naomi was when she got home. And... I just think, what is it about being at home with believers, with the church body, in the sanctuary that allows you to be transparent? Um, And if you don't feel this way, right, it could be judgment in the past or pride on your part, preventing you from being willing to open up, um, or a spirit of judgment from others, but either way, God is still sovereign and can move for his glory in this time. 
There was something about being home for Naomi that let her open up. And so I think that God is showing us that that is a function of the church body, is to open up. And if we don't feel that way, there's reasons why, and we can address those. But just know that it should be, right, a place where you can come and be transparent and open up. Um, so let me make sure my slides are sticking with it. Hebrews 10.25, and Teresa, I love it when God does this because Teresa already used this scripture and we're going to use it again. Hebrews 10.25. So it wasn't only important in Naomi's time for her to be able to go home and open up and be like, I am so mad and this is why. I am so hurt. I am so hurt I want to change my name. Okay, I don't even want to be called what I've been called. And I'm going to have a new name and this is my name and it means bitter. And she just owned it. Most people, if they've got some bitterness rolling around, they kind of hide it, right? (laughs) Like, I may be bitter, but that's for you to figure out. I'm not telling you. And she's like, no, call me Mara. I'm bitter. Um, And so not only was it a problem in her time, it still is. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We've got to come together. We've got to exhort one another. And we have to do it more than we've ever done it before. Um, Romans fourteen nineteen. It says, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. This is our job. Job sounds a little dutiful, but this is our, this is what our responsibility. This is what we need to be doing. And then 2 Corinthians 1, 4 through 6. who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth in Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Why would I stand up here and like bear my soul about being mad when my husband got saved? Why would I do that? This. For your consolation and your salvation. If you've ever gone through something similar and you think you're the only person in the world, I have a responsibility to go, no, I have been there. I understand. I understand how you're feeling. I felt that way too. It's okay. You're not the only person in the world that's felt that way. Um, And so at some point, um, and it sounds like it's easier than it really is, (laughs) but at some point you just have to not do it for the other person's sake. Do it for God's sake because he said to. He said, I'm going to comfort you in your tribulation because they're going to need it. It's really not about you. It's about them. Um, And chances are, if you would just kind of think back a little bit, there's somebody in your life that's done that too. They were like, oh, yeah, I've been there. Uh, That's what that felt like. Yeah, I completely understand. Um, So Naomi wanted to be called... Ruth. No, Naomi wanted to be called Mara because she was bitter. But this is so cool. I just love God's word. I love how intentional he is in his writings. Every, every word, every dot, every, everything is for a purpose. And he says in Ruth 120, 
She said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And then keep reading. Look down. Ruth, verse 22. Ruth chapter 1, verse 22. She doesn't even hardly get to finish saying that. And God says, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess. He's like, I'm not calling you that. That's not the name I gave you. That may be where you feel right now. That might be where you're wallowing right now, and we've all had days of wallowing. But that's not what I called you, and you're not gonna stay there. I'll call you Naomi, that's the name I gave you. So, we are not our circumstances, ever. She wanted her name to be based on her circumstances. And God said, you're not your circumstances. And our circumstances do not change how God sees us. Um, For example, look at Luke chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 31. I am so thankful for this tidbit that God was just like reminding me. There have been so many terrible circumstances over the last year um, for everybody, whether it's been health or jobs or financial insecurity or grief or um, it's so easy to get lost in your circumstances or your surroundings and your eyes off God and you know, just from a little personal reflection, like going to the mission field seems very godly. And it is. I'm, we're doing God's work, but it's so easy to get your eyes on the circumstances and kind of the shock and awe of it and lose sight of what God is doing. Whether it's just physical discomforts, and we have it so much easier than some, and I know that, and I try to remind myself of that very often when it's hot and humid and I'm smothering. I remind myself somebody had it worse. (laughs) Um, Or if I'm in traffic and it takes two hours to go a mile and a half, and it's just those little things that if I let myself, I will just get in the flesh and be like, these circumstances stink. I want to go home. But that's not what God's calling us to do. Um, So I'm just very thankful. Maybe he just showed it for me, but I'm very thankful that he kind of revealed that in his scripture, that that we are not defined by our circumstances, and we, we don't get to call ourselves what we feel in the midst of our circumstances. We just get to call ourselves what he calls us. And we're going to talk about that more, about what he calls us, so... Um, so Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou hast thrice denied that thou knowest not, that thou knowest, shall thrice deny that thou knowest me. That was a tongue twister. Um, But another example of, of God changing the name of a person because of um, what he wanted to call them. He defined the name. Um, you'll, see circum- you'll see times in the Bible where he changed a name, but it wasn't the person changing their name because of their circumstances. Um, and so I just thought that was a really cool, um, cool illustration. And also how vulnerable Simon, in verse 31, was uh, to be ate up by Satan. 
that he may sift you as wheat. That's personal. Um, and the Lord said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Um, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Just such, he has such a personal intimacy and relationship that he longs to have with each and every one of us. Um, the Samaritan woman, um, her circumstances didn't change how God saw her. He just wanted her to be a child of God. Um, Zacchaeus, people thought he was just a stinky tax collector, cheat person, you know, like a cheater. And Jesus just reached out to him because he wanted him to be a child of God. So um, not only are we not our circumstances, but other people are not their circumstances either. And it's so easy to define them. I thought I was going to get in trouble for Facebook ranting. Oh, sorry. Facebook ranting the other day because I saw some people like kind of bagging on the whole Oprah, um, Prince Harry, Meghan interview. And I got frustrated because um, affluent people still need Jesus. You know, and it's, it's easy to go, they must not have any problems. They got all the money in the world, them and Oprah too. Well, they both still need Jesus. If they're lost, it doesn't matter how much money they have or how affluent they are or how many servants there are or who does their beck and call, they still need Jesus. And so other people's circumstances don't define them either. And it's really just impacting my heart to be careful not to let myself do that, you know, not to identify other people by their circumstances, but do they need the Lord? Where are they at spiritually? That's the, that's the only thing that matters. Um, okay, we did Luke. Closing thoughts. Hopefully I'll wrap this up in a pretty little bow. Do I trust God's sovereignty enough to embrace my circumstances? I wrote that down for me. <laughs> and I'm sure it'll, God will use it to hit people in various places in their life. But leaving, a, leaving America for another country in any year is filled with challenges. And in the middle of a pandemia, it has a whole nother set of challenges too. And so that was for me. Um, do I trust God's sovereignty enough to embrace my circumstances? What is the end game? Why am I redeemed? It's really hard to fulfill a purpose if you have no clue what that purpose is, right? Like you can't do your job if you don't know what the instructions are. So what is the end game? Why am I redeemed? There's some universal answers to that question, but there's some personal answers to that question too. Am I transparent with my church family or my circle of friends or even myself? That last part was for me too. Because <laughs> I can really easy say, I'm fine, everything's fine. Todo está bien, that's my new saying I've learned. <laughs> everything's fine. Um, so am I transparent with my church family or my circle of friends or even myself? What have I called myself that God has not? And what does God call me? Because until, it's like repenting from sin. Until you replace that, it just leaves a hole. You can repent from the sin, but until you replace it with the word of God, and the truth, there's just a vacuum and something's going to fill it. And a lot of times Satan will just come back in and fill it with something else. And so, not only what have I called myself that God has not, but let's go back to the scripture. What has God called me? And that's really the only place we can find out what God has called us. So tonight, little homework, not much, just a little between you and God, there's no test. 
Look at Ephesians 1 and 2 and highlight all the things that God has called you. And just chew on that for a while because there will not be room for the lies that Satan has called you, that you've allowed yourself to be called by yourself or others or your circumstances. So look at Ephesians 1 and 2 and just highlight them. I did it in my Bible in purple. And whenever I start to get in that funk, like eyes on circumstances, this is too much, I'm not doing this, I'm checking out, then I can kind of just flip open and they're right there in purple. Beloved, quickened, redeemed. That's who you are. And so, as we go through Ruth this weekend, so much of it just has to do with our daily walk with the Lord and the picture that he paints in Ruth for how we're supposed to do that. And the theme word for, I guess, the the whole weekend is it's redeemed for the conference, but it comes from a place of intimacy. You have to get close to God. You have to get close to his word. You have to be honest and open with yourself first and with him so that he can mold you and have that that relationship that he desires to have with you. And if that's not something that you've ever thought about or initiated a relationship with God, like maybe you've heard about him or known about him, but to have a personal relationship with Jesus starts by accepting him as your savior. And if that's not something you've ever done or it's something you have questions about or you're, more in, you know, you're interested in asking um, about, you can talk to myself after church or Teresa um, or one of the other ladies here. If they don't know, they'll find someone that does. They'll bring you to a friend that can help share the word of God with you um, and show you how to have that relationship that God desires to have with you. Um, he was pursuing Ruth. And he was using Ruth's love for Naomi to draw her. And I know that there's a lot of ladies in this room who were invited by a friend. And I would venture to say that God gave us a really cool picture tonight about how your friend loves you. And your love for your friend is what God is using to draw you closer to him. So just lean into that and ask some more questions and come back tomorrow and we're going to talk more about it. But we're going to have a time of invitation. That's just a time of song and prayer at the end here. Um, If you want to come forward and pray, maybe there's some things you've called yourself that God uh, doesn't call you. Maybe you just needed a reminder of what he does call you. Um, Maybe you don't have a relationship with him and you want to know more about it. Uh, Just come up and talk to one of us and and, and, um, we'll be glad to show you about that. Um, But thank you, first of all, for your sacrifice and time in coming this weekend and, and stepping out in faith to get out in public and be with your sisters in a group like this. Uh, It takes courage. I get that. And so um, I'm going to pray, and Deb's going to play a little music, and you just come forward and let God deal with your heart however you need to. God, thank you so much for your words. God, thank you for this time that we could be together in your house, in your presence, with you. Lord, you are the word. There's no comfort outside of that, Lord. There's no purpose outside of that. There's no eternity. There's no relationship with you outside of the word of God. It is our treasure, and we value it so, Lord. God, I just pray for these ladies. I pray that you would work in our hearts, Lord, You've already done it in mine in just preparing this. You've exposed weak areas that need drawn closer to you, filled with your word, filled more with your spirit, Lord, that 
We can walk closer with you, hand in hand, Lord, intimate, knowing you as our savior, the lover of our soul, our friend, our father. Lord, thank you so much for the ladies that prepared this time. Lord, I just pray that you would work in these hearts. Just, um, just give us the liberty of transparency in this place, Lord, a safe place in your house where the Spirit of God is, that we can just be open and honest for the purpose solely of drawing closer to you, that we can be more like you and fulfill the things that you have called us to do, Lord. We love you so much. Thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you want to all stand, and we'll have a time of prayer, and come forward if you want.